A question that you can get on JavaScript interview really often is what design patterns you know and how exactly they are working. This is why by the end of this video you will learn all most popular JavaScript design patterns and how to implement it correctly, so you can pass your interview successfully. And the sponsor of this video is Verpex. Verpex offers a full range of hosting services, from reseller and VPS hosting to shared hosting, dedicated servers and domain registration. Whenever you are running your personal website, an online business or even your own hosting company, Verpex has options for you. If you want to start your own hosting business or manage multiple websites easily, reseller hosting includes cPanel, automated daily backups and 24-7 support. You can set your own pricing, create hosting plans and let Verpex handle the infrastructure. If you need more performance than VPS hosting, gives you dedicated resources and data centers worldwide. If you need even more power, dedicated servers provide full hardware access with no resource sharing. So if you are looking for scalable and affordable hosting, check out Verpex, you can find the link in the description box below. With that being said, let's jump into the video. And the first question is obviously what is a design pattern? Design patterns are reusable, well-proven solutions to common problems that occur in software design. They are templates or blueprints that help developers solve specific design challenges efficiently and consistently. To put it simply, design is exactly the same solution to the problem that you are getting again and again. Why it is important to know design patterns? First of all, you understand what solution can help you with specific problem, and secondly, you can easier communicate with other developers when you are just given the name of specific design pattern, and typically other person would immediately understand what you are talking about. And if you think that you never use design patterns in your life and you are totally fine, this is for sure wrong. You might use design patterns every single day and not even understand that you are using them. So let's look here on the most popular design patterns and how to implement them. And the first pattern here is a singleton pattern. Let's have a look on the implementation first. And the goal of this pattern is to return just a single instance of the class. Typically, when we are writing new and the name of the class, we are getting new instance. Singleton works differently, it is possible to have just a single instance, doesn't matter how many times you call new. Let's have a look on the code. The commented code here is an okayish code. This is how people typically are solving that. So inside class we have a static property instance, which basically means it is living in the class. Inside constructor we are checking if we have an instance on the config, then we are returning it, in other case we are assigning it. Then here we are creating new config, config1 and config2, and they are referencing the same object. This is totally normal implementation, but you can do a little bit better. Here is the better code. As you can see, it is super simple. We have here an instance on our class, we have an empty constructor, and instead we have a function getInstance. So basically we moved our code from constructor to this getInstance function. And it does exactly the same, if we don't have an instance, it instantiates your config, in other case it returns you an instance. And here is how we are using it, config get instance, and then the config1 and config2 will be the same. Why this approach is better? Because it doesn't break the logic how your class is typically working. Here when you are using new config and you didn't check an implementation, you are sure that you are generating a new instance. This may be confusing. In this case here we see ok, we have a getInstance function and it returns for us exactly the same instance always. We are not using here new keyword, this is why it is a better approach. The second important design pattern is called factory. When do we need to use that? We typically want to do that when we need to dynamically create our objects and we can easily add new types in our factory without changing the existing code. So let's have a look on real world example. We have here a notification interface with just a send method. And we have three classes, an email notification, SMS and push notification. 
they all implement their own send function. Now we are creating our notification factory with just a single function create notification. We are getting inside a type as a string and by this type we are instantiating different class like email, sms or push. And here is the usage. We have here notification type, like for example an email, and we are calling our notification factory create notification and provide inside a type. Most importantly, our notification will work exactly the same in all cases, doesn't really matter what type we are talking about, and we can easily extend our notification factory with other types. So first of all, our factory hides the complexity of creating notifications. Secondly, we have here a single responsibility. Each separate class has its own implementation. The next pattern is an observer pattern, and it defines one-to-many dependency where changes to one object or subject automatically reflected in other observers. First of all, let's have a look on plain JavaScript implementation without TypeScript, because it will be easier to understand without creating lots of interfaces. And then we will see our TypeScript version. So as you can see, we are defining a class emitter, and inside we have events, which is an object. And we have two functions, on and emit. With on, you can subscribe to some change, and with emit, you can trigger that. Here is how we are using it. We have our emitter, new event emitter, and we can write emitter on data, and this is our unique string, which is our event, and the callback. So basically with this single line, we are subscribing to this specific event. Now we can use emitter emit with the name of this event and some additional data to trigger this action. And then all our subscribers, which we wrote with on, will get this callback. And in exactly the same way, we can create, for example, an error action and emit it later. The name can be whatever. And here is an implementation with on, what we are doing, we are checking, do we already register such event? And if no, we are creating it in our object. After this, we are just pushing this listener, which is a callback, as an additional listener to an array inside our event. With emit, what we are checking is that when such event is registered, we want to loop through all our listeners and call them. Now let's look on TypeScript implementation, which is important because it type all this stuff correctly, and it looks much more difficult. First of all, we have here a type listener with T and the class event emitter. Let's have a look on the usage directly here. First of all, we are defining our my events, which is the specific implementation. We are defining here all our events that can happen, like data and error, and what parameters we need to provide inside. The usage is exactly the same, but now inside new event emitter we are providing this interface, so it is correctly typed. Now let's have a look on the code. In our class event emitter we are creating events which have keys of our T that we provided inside, which means these keys from the interface. And now we are doing exactly the same code, but now we are sure that it is correctly covered with TypeScript. The next popular pattern is called strategy pattern. Let's have a look on the code and you immediately understand what is the usage. So first of all, here we are defining all our validation strategies like email and password. And we are creating the strategies here. This is just an object with key value where the key is our strategy name and the value is a function that we are applying. Now we have a validate function which extends our validation strategies and just call them by type and input. Now we can use this validate function and provide inside an input and a type and then we will select different strategy based on the type that we provided inside. When strategy pattern is useful, when you want to define multiple strategies for different conditions, like for example in validation. In this case, every single strategy is completely separated and you don't need to update any of them when you need to add new strategy. As we are using Redux a lot in different projects, you can get a question how Redux pattern is working. And not a lot of people can answer this question because everybody are using Redux, like with Redux DevTools, but not a lot of people fully understand how simply it is working under the hood. Let's have a look. So Redux pattern is about having a global state and dispatching some actions. 
Then we have a single reducer function that changes our state and notify subscribers. And as you can see here, what I used is create store from Redux library and it is deprecated. And I did that on purpose. It is not recommended to use nowadays create store, but it shows exactly how it is working under the hood. So we define our actions and an interface and the state. So we're saying that our global state is just an array of strings. After this, we are defining our reducer function and inside we are writing all cases how every specific action can change our state. Most importantly, this reducer function is completely immutable. Now, in order to create our store, we are throwing reducer, which is just a function, inside create store. Now, on the store, we have several functions, like for example, store.subscribe. And essentially, it is exactly like on and the meet that you saw previously. With subscribe, we will be notified every single time when our state changes. And we can just call store get state in order to read new data from it. When we need to make some changes to our state, we are calling store.dispatch and providing inside a type. Type is mandatory, payload can be whatever. So basically, after we created our store and subscribed with store subscribe, we are dispatching actions like this and they are coming in the reducer. We understand, okay, user did an action with type add user, we are modifying our state and we are getting to this subscribe. This is how Redux is working under the hood. There is no magic, this is just a simple subscribe and dispatch functionality. Another pattern is module pattern, and you can still get this question on the interview, but it is a little bit out of date. Why is that? Because typically previously we used immediately invoked function expressions, we are not doing that anymore. Instead, we're using ECMAScript 6 modules, which you might know like imports and exports. This is a modern way to isolate every single file inside its own module and export just what we want to. But before it was different, we didn't have this approach. This is where we had a specific module pattern. And here how it looked like. We just create a function like user module, and instead of just having a function, we directly call it. So we're wrapping the whole function with brackets, and then we're just calling it. And what it does, it does not pollute our global namespace with all local properties that we have inside function, because all these properties are isolated in the function. If you just have a JavaScript file and you write a bunch of local properties, then they will all get to the window namespace by default. Obviously, when we're using bundlers, it is different because they are hiding all this logic, but essentially this is how it was working previously under the hood. By doing that, for example, this const users variable will never get in the global namespace. And the only thing that is available outside is this user module. The next question that you can get is, can you describe an MVC pattern and how it is relevant to front-end frameworks? So MVC pattern is model view and controller, which is not really relevant to the front-end because it was created as a back-end pattern. But we're using it partially on the client also. For example, inside React, we have just a view model on the component level. Your model in React is just some state management, like your state, Redux, Sustend, or whatever library you prefer. And your view is just a React component that renders its state. Inside Angular, we have a little bit more of MVC. We can say that model is something like service layer or data bound components. Then our view is simply HTML files. And Angular components are similar to controllers, where they manage logic between model, like service, and our view. So yes, there are some similarities, but we are not directly using MVC approaches nowadays in the frontend. Another question that you can get on React interview, for example, is what is a container presenter pattern in React? And you might also know it as a smart and dumb components. This is exactly the same. What does it mean? We have two different types of components. Either we have a component which simply renders markup based on some props, it doesn't have any business logic or state inside, and we have another type of component which has exactly state business logic and it typically renders other components which does not have the state. 
So container or smart component is your parent component where you have your state and logic. And presenter or dumb component is the component which is simply rendering your markup when you provide to it some props. And the last question that can be also asked, can you explain the adapter pattern and its use in integrating third-party libraries? Let's have a look on this example. Let's say we are talking about a payment system. We have a class third-party payment gateway. This is some library that we want to use. Most importantly, it has a function process payment. Now we have our payment processor. This is exactly our own system and our own interface. We have a make payment function. Now here what we are doing, we are implementing an adapter pattern by creating payment gateway adapter. And it extends our payment processor, so we are sure that it works exactly the same like our system. What we are doing inside, we are getting some third-party gateway and we are using it. But we still need to implement functions like make payment in order to comply with our payment processor. But inside we are using this third-party library as we want. And here is the usage. First of all, we are instantiating our third-party payment gateway and then we are providing it inside our payment gateway adapter. What we are getting as a result is our payment processor, which is exactly our system processor, and it works as you want it, because it hides completely the implementation of third-party library. So when does it make sense to use an adapter? When you don't really want to use directly some library, because you might throw it away later and use some other library or your own solution, and you are hiding it inside your adapter. So you simply wrap a library in some class or function and use your own implementation instead. Then you know you just need to update a single place when you want to change your third-party library and not 1000 places if you use it directly across your whole application. I am sure that this knowledge will help you a lot on your future interview, but if you want to learn even more about web development, I have lots of advanced courses on my website where you can access all of them with this single monthly subscription, and I will link it in the description box below.